what inspired you to get into acting? What matters is the story and how you craft it. You've answered a lot of the questions already with that one answer, so that's why. <laughs> People are interested in Bundy. Are there too many movies about him? Maybe, I don't know, I can't answer that question. You know, I made one, so, you know, clearly I thought that I had something to say. You think you're smarter than him. You think you're going to be the one that's going to get him to confess. Well, I don't think I'm smarter, sir. I don't think you necessarily have to be smarter. This is what's going to happen. He will come down. He'll toy with you for a little while. Does your son know what you do? He knows his daddy protects people. He will cat and mouse with you. He will make you think you are getting somewhere. Let's record him. Let's get this party started. It is February 13th, 1986. This is Agent Bill Hagmeyer. I'm sitting with Theodore. Oh, Ted. I'm sitting with Ted Bundy. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcasting platform. Thank you. Welcome to Film Forums. I'm Richard Williams, and today I have a very special guest with me, um, filmmaker Amber Seeley. Um, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Hi, I'm Amber Seeley. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks very much for uh, for joining us. So could you tell us a little bit about your, your filmmaking journey? Um, I understand that you originally were from, from England, um, but now based in Los Angeles, is that right? Yes, I'm originally born in Brighton, but then we left England when I was three. And then I went back to go to drama school. I went to, um, I did an, a Shakespeare program at RADA and then went to Central for my master's and studied theater. And then I started working with a theater company there called Shunt that I don't, it no longer is around, but it was um, very cool and really fun to be a part of um, when I was living there. And, and a lot of our productions, or we would call them experiences, they were devised theater. And a lot of them involved um, some sort of video art. And, and we would do these cabaret performances um, that often involve video art. And I just started getting really interested in that aspect of it. As a performer, I would often perform alongside of uh, pre-recorded video, you know, I guess you'd call it performance art. Uh, films that I had made. And, um, and I got very inspired by the dogma movement that was going on in Europe at the time. And um, it was actually Michael Winterbottom's Nine Songs. I don't know if you are familiar with that film, but I'm a big Michael Winterbottom fan. And that movie came out and I remember the press at the time was like, this is a real relationship and real sex. And, and when I saw the movie, I loved it. It's a brilliant movie, but the two actors are stunning. They're literally models. And, you know, the man had the largest penis you know that you've seen on film <laughs> except with pornos obviously um but uh you know and they they both had just this perfect sex life every time they had sex they would come and i was all, and i was sort of like well, that's not a real relationship you know real relationships have ups and downs and 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 in this you know the sex is more complicated and it's sillier it doesn't look like a perfume ad you know and so i made my first film called a plus d when i was living in london um, we shot it in Stoke Newington and it was um, kind of a reaction, I guess, you know, to nine songs and, and feeling like um, also, you know, like I said, in my interest in dogma films, but I was feeling like, uh, you know, this is what I think of as a real relationship and how messy and complicated they can be, how ugly they can be, you know, how relationships are not always beautiful aesthetically. Um, so I made that and then that just got me really interested in the whole process of film, you know, I had never really done a long term edit on anything before and, you know, the whole post process. And, and then uh, in, during post, I'd actually moved back to America. I moved to Los Angeles and um, and I didn't know anything about the film industry or how it worked here. Um, and, uh, you know, it just kind of got involved in that. And I started learning about distribution and how you get films out there and the film festival circuit and all that kind of thing and that anyway so then I just was on this journey of being a filmmaker and then I've, I've made four features and one short and some music videos since then. Mm -hmm. Okay well that's cool you've had um, quite a journey since you, you first started then what would you say is sort of the hardest thing about being a director now you had a little bit of experience and, and what's the easiest um, aspects of being a, a director slash filmmaker? I mean, the hardest thing is just that you have to keep going. You know, there's, there's, um, everyone always asks like, what's the path? And I'm like, there's not one path. You just have to, if it's right for you, you keep going. And um, well, I mean, I, I guess the hardest thing is, um, you know, it's, it's not always a meritocracy. 
And I think there's a huge number of people in this industry who are successful because they either are related to somebody already in the industry or they're just, they come from money. If you have a family that can support you in your early years while you are making your first films or going to school, you just have a leg up. And I think that's part of the problem and why we have a limitation of voices in our industry, you know, um, is that people who cannot afford to take, you know, 10 years off of earning money, uh, earning, you know, real money where you can buy a house and, you know, pay for everything your children need and things like that. So those people sadly often have to, to fall away. Um, so that's probably the hardest thing is that it's not entirely a meritocracy. Um, for me, at least. Everyone has their own struggles. You know, everyone has their own struggles. Uh, but that's one of the things that bums me out about it. That's why I love any sort of initiative that are reaching out to, you know, communities that are not uh, often very involved in the film industry, you know, other parts of the world. Um, those people have really interesting stories to tell as well. And so it's, you know, the more we can find, you know, new, new voices, new people, I think the better our industry will be. hundred percent. That, that's a huge part of the reason, if not the whole reason why we exist, uh, film forums to, to network, inspire the next generation of filmmakers, learn from, from you guys, guys that have, have been there and, and kind of done it. Um, so, uh, you know, everything you're saying there really, you know, really appeals to me and it will appeal to everyone watching and listening to this um but yeah so what's the easiest aspect of of directing what kind oh, of yeah. either, either comes easily to you or you think as a director yeah that that's cool that's easy I skipped over that part of your question didn't i yeah, um, that's all right. the, the easiest um i mean for me the easiest is working with actors i was an actor for so many years i, I studied acting and and so for me that it's just like i you know i love actors i love acting i love just the whole process so that part is really easy for me but it's different for everybody some of these questions are kind of stapled because um yeah we'll get a different answer every time and that's fascinating to to see everyone's different approaches and experiences to get to the kind of the same point um like you don't have to go to film school necessarily you can do it you know, under your own wing if you take a different direction to other people so um and that's inspiring to different people in, in different backgrounds and cultures and their own limitations and stuff can you tell us about um, No Man of God, um, the film that you've uh, got coming out that you directed? Uh, yeah, No Man of God. It's uh, well, it's basically about this this um, FBI agent named Bill Hagmeyer, who was one of the very first um, what's called profilers. Uh, Ronald Reagan, who was a president here in the 80s, um, he set up the very first FBI profiling department. And Bill Hagmeyer was one of the guys who was the, there were four or five of them in the beginning. And um, yeah, he was kind of a newbie and no one wanted to take on Bundy. And he was like, OK, I'll do it, you know. And um, and then he ended up, you know, being really a really, really good profiler and 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 getting Bundy to open up and come clean about his crimes and and admit to things that he had never told any other investigator or profile who had tried to kind of crack him open before. Um, and so Hagmeyer went on to become one of the best and most prolific um, uh, profilers in the business. He's now retired and, and uh, lives still in the States on the East Coast with his family. Um, but the movie is about basically that process of what it was like for Bundy and Hagmeyer to um, come together in a room, right? They met over a series of five years, multiple times, they would sit down for two to three hours together. And it's about their relationship and how they um, both became friends and how they also wore each other down and how they were performing for each other. And, you know, it's about the mental swordplay that the two of them are engaging in. And, um, and then it's also about larger things like, you know, what does it mean when you believe in God? What is it like to sit so close to evil? You know, how do you remain a good person when you are so engaged with somebody that's so evil, you know? And it obviously looks at, you know, who Bundy was, um, you know, we're asking the questions of like, you know, uh, why did he do these things? And, you know, my answer is that he was a psychopath and he was a narcissist and he was deeply insecure, but he did it because essentially he thought he was better than other people. He thought that, you know, what he was getting out of his control of those women, his victims, he thought that that feeling for him was more important than those women's lives. Um, and then the film also asks questions uh, more subtly, right? It's a little bit more of a gentle through line in the film of like, you know, 
why are we as an audience, as a society, so interested in people like this? You know, why is it that there are 22 films that have now been made about Bundy? Um, and I'm as guilty as the next, right, for having made this film. So it's not about, you know, me judging people having interest in it. You know, I myself have interest in it. So it's it's about, it's asking the question of like, hey, let's look inwards and try and find out why do we know Bundy's name and not all the victims' names? You know, what just what is that about? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's an interesting question to me. And then also <clears throat> I wanted to ask, you know, what is it like for the women in the room? You know, every single woman that I know knows what it's like to walk down a dark street or a dark alley and hear footsteps behind you and get scared, right? That happens multiple times in one's life if you ever venture out at night walking, you know, alone. Um, and we all know what that fear feels like, right? And for the most part, most men, again, I'm generalizing, don't know what that feels like. So to me, it was really interesting to kind of ask that question, um, you know, so we have these kind of voiceless women in the room, but they very pointedly look at the camera, they look at Bill, they look at Bundy, and sometimes we go and we zoom in on them. And we're asking like, wow, what is it like for them? I really like that dynamic because you've actually kind of answered the, the following question that I had for you, which was going to be along the lines of a criticism aimed at this film and others, because there's at least one other major feature coming out, um, you know, is penciled in for um, about Ted Bundy. I didn't realize it was over 20 films on Ted Bundy. One of the criticisms that would be leveled at the film is there's too many films about Ted Bundy. And I was going to ask you why you took the project on and, and were you happy with what you achieved in relation to it? And I think you've you've kind of answered some of that already with the, the, the comprehensive answer you've just given. Um, I, I Looking at sort of in my research, I, I read a couple of interviews where you'd said that it was important for you to have a lot of um, you know, heads of department um, as being women on the film. And um, compared to perhaps some of the other film productions that have, have come out with, with Ted Bundy in a kind of male oriented kind of focus. So, yeah, do you, do you feel that you did achieve what you set out to achieve in terms of um, the focus on, on kind of the female um, side of things? Um, well, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I think that probably, you know, it's for others to decide that if you achieved it or not, you know, I mean, I'm certainly, I was nervous when the movie first came out, you know, uh, like, are people going to see what we were doing with the women and the victims? And I'm really happy to see that when I talk to people like you, you know, interviewers that they are asking about that, which makes me sigh a big, you know, really, you know, sigh of relief. I'm like, okay, good. You know, it's in the movie enough, you know, cause I was always like, is it too subtle? Should we make, you know, so it's nice. It's being picked up on people are seeing it. Some people have even asked, you know, that the women look like the victims and they do. We purposely cast and dress them to look like actual victims. We, we tried to as much as possible copy uh, outfits that we found of the women online. And that's a, you know, kind of, what is it called? Easter egg or something. You know, I think only certain mm -hmm. people will pick that up, but. Um, that, that demonstrates to me a highly respectful approach to what were well, most, the most important people in the film, really the, the victims, as well as uh, the FBI um, agent, you know, so that, that, that demonstrates for me a respectful and detailed approach to, to a subject where Ted Bundy himself, uh, as a, every, a lot of people would agree, is kind of glorified but ultimately he's a psychopath and a serial killer. So I think it's great that you've you've uh, gone with that approach. Thank you, yeah, yeah, no, it was really important to me that we represented the victims in a way that was um, respectful and sort of without, like I said, I mean, they, they weren't in the film so they couldn't have a literal voice, but I wanted to give them a, a really important, uh, theoretical is not the right word, I'm sorry, I'm terrible at coming up with words, but um, you know, that, that they had some sort of gravitas and some sort of importance in the picture um, that uh, that felt weighted and weighty and important and, and emotional without it being saccharine or, you know, um, cheesy or exploitative. But I feel like I didn't answer your other question about, you know, it, it is really true that, um, you know, yeah, like I said, you know, there's been 22 films now made about Bundy. And to my counting, I could be wrong, but again, I'm the second Bundy uh, female director, um, possibly third. But, um, you know, and I do think it's important, you know, I mean, the, the subject matter is the mutilation of women's bodies, the ending of their lives, you know, and to me, I feel like there's, like we were talking about with the dark alley, you know, that particular fear of your body being taken over like that is a fear that 
that for the most part, again, generalizing, women know and understand intimately. You know, I mean, the statistics of one out of every three women will be sexually assaulted in their lives is, it's staggering. And so to me, that's very much like women's business, you know? So um, so it's important to me. I'm not saying men shouldn't direct films about Bundy. They, of course they should, but I, you know, to me, it should be equally weighted. You know, I want women to be able to weigh in on the conversation because I do feel like, you know, um, the knowledge of what that feels like to potentially be a victim of something like that feels like a very female, um, sadly, you know, a thing that, that women know quite intimately. So, um, but yeah, you look, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, also, this is a business, you know, and we have to make films that people are interested in. And there's interest in serial killers. And is that right or wrong? I don't know. I think some of it is certainly wrong. And some of it is certainly human. You know, it, to me, it's like the rubbernecking when you're driving on the freeway and you see a car accident. I think there's something very human about the interest in other people's pain and other people's, you know, to a sense, in a sense, gore. I mean, it's awful and it's sad, but we also were going like, oh my God, what happened to that person? You know, and to me, there is something good and, and pure about that, you know, about the interest in, in something awful that may have happened to somebody else. It, it's, it, it's, it's, so it's both bad and good. Like everything is complicated, you know? And so, um, you know, yeah, people are interested in Bundy. Are there too many movies about him? Maybe, I don't know, I can't answer that question. You know, I made one, so, you know, clearly I thought that I had something to say, um, but I certainly, you know, when people have the criticism of there being too many Bundy movies, I, I don't, I can't, they're not wrong, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I guess I don't know what to say that, except like I completely agree and understand. And I felt like I had something more to add to the conversation because I felt like what I'm saying in this film, you know, and this is not to disparage any other films. I think all the other funny films are brilliant, but um, you know, I had something different to say and I hadn't, what I said in No Man of God, I haven't seen that in any of the other Bundy movies. So to me, it was adding a new chapter to the canon of films on Bundy. Um, and whether or not that's enough to justify the making of the entire film, that's not up to me to decide, you know, that's up to the film watching audience as a whole. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And, and a riposte if you need, even need a riposte. So um, no, well, well put, I, I think. Can you explain the dynamics on set in relation to Elijah Wood? Um, because he was, as, as far as I understand, an actor and a producer on this. So how did that kind of work in practice in terms of his involvement? So what, what was he like to work with in those two kind of roles? Elijah is a gem. He's a true gem. He is, yes, he it's his he is a partner in the production company Spectravision. So he was the producer, but he is so adept at taking off and on the hats when appropriate. So when he needs to be a producer, he's got the producer hat on. When he needs to be an actor, he's got the actor hat on. And he's just been in the business for so long that he know, you know, he knows. So when he was on set, he wasn't a producer at all. Uh, as far as I saw, <laughs> you know, when he was on set, he was an actor, you know, in, in, in uh, when once we started rehearsals through to the end of the last cut, you know, uh, he was an actor and he was so wonderful. I mean, he just is, like I said, he's a real gem. He's a real professional. He's such a sweetheart. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, he would, there was what, you know, that, if you've seen the movie, I don't want to give away the kind of climax of the under the water monologue, but you know, there was this thing that I had asked him to do and he was like, I don't know. And I was like, listen, let's just try it. And if we don't, you know, like it, we, it can end up on the cutting room floor, not a problem, you know? And, uh, and he was like, okay. You know, and I was thinking, oh no, is he not going to really go for it? And, he, you know, I, I should have known better. He completely just knocked it out of the park was amazing. And, you know, and that's all you can really ask of an actor, right. Is to even try things just for them to try things that they don't think are necessarily right to still go for it 100% because they might be right and you might be wrong. Who knows? But, you know, um, but the fact that he was willing to just do it and he didn't put on his producer hat and go like, no, sorry, I'm going to put my foot down and say, no, he just was like, okay, great, let's do it. And um, yeah, he's just lovely. He's a real, he's a real sweetheart. He's so smart, so kind, so thoughtful. And, and, and I just love his face. I mean, I, come on. <laughs> yes, yeah, epic. Um, absolutely. Everyone obviously remembers him from Lord of the Rings, but I think the the, the career path he's sort of taken after that, kind of the, the movie choices he's made, especially immediately after Lord of the Rings, I kind of think says quite a lot about him as an actor, similar to DiCaprio, I think. Didn't always, he could have gone through a, down a certain path and, and, he, and he 
chose not to and I think that's quite that's really good and reflects well on him as, a, as an actor. Spectre Vision if you look at their 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 roster you know roster again I don't think that's the right word there either but they have such interesting weird you know movies and I think that's just a testament to who Elijah and the other you know company members are that they you know they're they're true filmmakers and they love film and they're not it's not about fame or you know any of that stuff for them it's it's about like what is interesting and what is cool and like and going down that road and um and i think that that's really who elijah is you know he's just an interesting person yeah and what i just wanted to narrow down on um if that's okay is in terms of um being a sort of producer so what for those who literally don't know who are just thinking about embarking on a career in, in the film industry what um was his role practically speaking as a producer on the film. So acting is kind of obvious, although there's there's nuances and, and, and things and complications for that. But in terms of him being a producer, what did he bring um, to, to that? Literally, what, what did he do? What are the practicalities of, of him being a producer on that film? Well, if I can back up a little bit first, the first thing is, is that producer is almost the most confusing thing, I think, for people in the film industry, because it, it's almost anything and everything. There are so many different kinds of producers. And even just like the title producer, right? There's, there's creative producers, there's financial producers, there are line producers, UPMs, you know, there's, there are so many different kinds of skills that are involved in being a producer. Um, and, and some people are good at only some of those things, some people are good at all of those things. Um, but it's really important to know the different things that if you if you're the director or the writer or the actor, even it's really important to know what are the different kinds of producers? Cause they're all gonna be called a producer and you're gonna be like, oh, they're a producer. But it's really important to know like, what is it that they do and they focus on? So one of the things that's great about SpectraVision is that um, they have a lot of producers, right? I mean, all, they, all of the partners are producers but they all each have a different lane that they focus on. Um, and it works really well. Um, so, you know, Daniel, Noah, um, he's most, I, I'm gonna, butcher what their official titles are. So forgive me for that. They'll Spectre Vision will have to speak to you and Claire. I'm, and I could be getting, getting some things wrong. So, you know, take all this with a grain of salt. Um, but Daniel Noah is, is a creative producer. So he will work on, you know, um, if, if, if a project is already in development, he will work on, you know, working on the script and development and then just any kind of creative conversations. And Elijah does that a little bit as well. Um, and, and, I think Elijah's more of the larger, like sort of vision for, for Spectra Vision. So he's more involved in, as I'm talking, I'm like, I'm just talking out of my ass here. I don't even really know. You should ask them. <laughs> let me back up. Let me back up a little bit. Just to clarify, like they each have their own lane and they're each really good at their own lane. Um, there are certain conversations creatively that will involve all of them. And there are certain conversations financially that will involve all of them. And then there are certain conversations where you'll each like, you know, pick the individual lane. So in terms of how Elijah works with SpectraVision at large, like you'd have to ask him because they, they have conversations and stuff that I'm just not privy to and I don't know. But in terms of the, you know, the individual film, we certainly had a lot of like development conversations, Elijah and Daniel and I, and Kim Sherman as well, who's another producer and, and um, new to, uh, new to their company in the last few years. Um, and, and like I said, though, then, you know, once we got into production, Elijah's producer hat really came off and then he became an actor. And then once we were in post, you know, his producer hat came back on. He loves to be really involved in music. You know, he's really, uh, he's a DJ as well. And he really knows a lot about music. And so that part was really important to him and also to Daniel. Um, the important thing to know is like, you have to understand what, what you're, if you're the director and you're bringing on a producer, you have to understand what is it that you need and then find somebody who has those particular skills. A lot of people say they're producers, but are they people who are good at fundraising and connecting you to financiers? Or are they people that are gonna wanna like work on the script with you and, and develop the story? And you need to ask those specific questions when you're meeting them, you know, do you see yourself as a creative producer? Because if your thing is like, oh, I just need someone who's gonna like help hire the crew, help organize the shoot and help find financing, that's very different. 
Most producers want to be creatively involved in the story. So it's really important to ask them that question. Um, and that's different from when, you know, what I'm talking about with SpectraVision and stu you know, the studios and SpectraVision and large production companies, they have already figured out their system and they know what they do and who does what. But when you're starting out, I think it's often confusing what producers do and who does what. And I think it's very easy to hire a producer who you think will help you find financing and they think essentially they're also a director. So it's important to in, inexperienced producers um, sometimes themselves don't know what a producer is supposed to do. So it's incumbent upon you as the as the director and also as a producer when you're starting out, you will be producing um, to, to kind of understand what the different kinds of producing are and find people that serve the things that you need. But none of this applies to SpectraVision or, you know, Understood. Thank you for that. I appreciate no, I appreciate you adding that onto the the answer. Um, what one in, in sort of one or two lines? What advice would you give to uh, aspiring filmmakers in terms of the experience that you've accumulated to this point? So, kind of maybe what one thing do you wish you'd known perhaps um, when you started out in filmmaking? There isn't anything. That's the thing. There isn't anything. There isn't one path. There isn't one way. You know. Uh, just be yourself, surround yourself with uh, good friends and family if you have it and try to have a good quality of life and uh, don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great way to end, end the interview. Um, I'm glad we managed to smuggle that soundbite in at the end there. So um, <laughs> on that note, um, thank you for being a fabulous guest. Thank I really, you. really appreciate it. And I really look forward to putting this out there. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, great speaking with you. Thank you. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcasting platform. Thank you.